Good morning, everyone. Let's all stand together. Happy Palm Sunday to you. We're going to be taking communion, so if you haven't grabbed those elements yet, they're in the back. But before we get in the Word, let's all just worship the Lord together. I come before you now. I bring my sin and doubt. You trade a glory for my shame. I plead your blood to pay, to pay my debts of wrong. Your saving grace has made me holy. Oh, I lift a shout to the God who saves Let the rocks cry, let your people sing Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest Hosanna, our
of every song we could ever see Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you 
that song that we sing is so true God that you won't ever fail us you're our firm foundation Lord and we just pray that you would prepare our hearts for your word this morning go before us in Jesus name amen as you're turning to John 1 you might be saying Pastor Brett shouldn't you be doing a uh, Palm Sunday service as it is Palm Sunday Uh, or are you just going to go through the Bible study today and the answer is yes (laughs) Um, it's not, I find a lot of times it's not that hard. I mean, the Bible's so interconnected and there's something here that will connect, uh, trust me, uh, on the Palm Sunday uh, note, which is gonna be fun. But I wanted to draw your attention to uh, one little phrase spoken by the, the greatest man that ever walked the earth other than Jesus. Jesus. Now, does anybody know who that is? John the Baptist. Jesus said that. Uh, isn't that amazing? In Matthew eleven eleven, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, among those that are born among women, there's not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Um, that's, that's really something for Jesus to say that. Uh, I remember when Muhammad Ali was in an airplane, you know, he always said, I am the greatest of all time. I am the greatest. Um, but on this airplane, this, uh, he wasn't buckled up and the flight attendant said, Mr. Ali, you need to buckle your safety belt. He said, Superman don't need no safety belt. And, um, and she said, well, Superman don't need no airplane either, Mr. Ali. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently he's not the greatest. Uh, he was quite the great fighter. Uh, but, uh, but John the Baptist, as it turns out, uh, is in fact the greatest. And so um, th- this, is, this message, this short little tiny half of a sentence almost, um, is what I want to draw our attention to. It's John chapter 1, verse 36. Let's take a look. John 1, 36. It says, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, behold the Lamb of God. There it is. What was it that made John the Baptist the greatest man ever born among women, as Jesus said? Um, I think there's really kind of an easy answer to that. And and it's, it's this, that John the Baptist, his sole purpose for life, his reason for existence was to point people to Jesus. That was his whole deal. It was all about pointing people to Jesus. Um, that, uh, you know, I, I wonder, you know, he was extremely cautious to avoid any misunderstanding of, of who Jesus was versus who he was. You know, we're told there in John 1, 23, uh, when they ask you, who are you? And he said, I'm just the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Um, and, and he said, to make straight the way um, of the Lord. That means to, to sort of prepare the way for Jesus. That's, what, that's his whole existence. Um, Luke chapter three, verse 15, um, as they came out to hear John with expectation, um, uh, they all mused, it says there in Luke uh, three fifteen. they mused in their hearts whether John was the Christ. He must be the, there was something special enough about John that they, they maybe thought, is this the Messiah? Is this the Christ? But I love it. John answered them all saying, um, I, I indeed baptize you with water but there's one much mightier than I that's coming and I'm not even worthy to uh, loose the latchet of his shoes. That's what he said. John was always very careful to give glory to Jesus, point to Jesus. It wasn't, you know, hallelujah me, it was hallelujah, Yahweh, Jesus. And and that's what John, that should be your and my uh, endeavor as well. If you wanna be great, don't get TikTok clicks or get a Oscar or Grammy. If you want to be great, don't, don't you know, try to have a huge career. Whatever, some of those things are okay. But, uh, but what you and I really should do is we exist for his pleasure, the Bible says in Romans, um, pardon me, Revelation chapter four. And, and so what we do is we say, okay, if I exist for his pleasure, one of the things I'm supposed to be, like we said last week, is that light switch that turns on the light that lets people see Jesus. John the Baptist said in John 3.30, he must increase but I must decrease. I almost wonder if there's any end to what a person can do for the kingdom, unstoppable, as long as the glory is all going to Jesus. As soon as the glory starts going to that person, it it seems like I've noticed uh, just over years and watching ministries and people, 
um, one of the biggest downfalls is when all the glory starts going to a person and they start to sort of get in the way of pointing to Jesus Christ. God forbid. And may that be true of Athey Creek. I hope that when people come to this church, they don't go, wow, look at Athey Creek or wow, look at you know the staff or look at Pastor Brett. Um, the, the goal here is to say, come on in and let's look at Jesus together. Jesus is the author, the perfecter of our faith. It's all about Jesus Christ. And, and one of the greatest things you can do is point to Jesus. Um, I like the psalmist, Psalm 34, uh, verse three through five. Uh, the psalmist said, oh, magnify the Lord with me when I was a little kid. And I would read this little verse. I'd, I, I had a magnifying glass. You know, you, you guys know, you know, you burned ants and stuff with it. Um, and looked through the mirror and got your eyeball really big and stuff, just fun stuff. But I remember seeing that going, oh, magnify, I'm supposed to be like a magnifying glass, um, not to burn people, but, but to, to enlarge, to make people see Jesus bigger and more clearly. That's what the psalmist is saying. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And, and then he says, let us exalt his name together. That's what we're all supposed to be doing. Um, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. And then notice verse five, they looked unto him. That's looking to Jesus really, ultimately. Um, and they were lightened. You might say, as they looked unto him, they were enlightened and their faces were not ashamed. Um, that's the key. That's why the author of Hebrews is looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. So um, this is John the Baptist. Now, what does he start with? Simple little phrase, behold the lamb of God. Um, this would mean perhaps more to the Jewish audience of that day than it does to the American audience today because, um, you know, the, the, the idea of a lamb and what is this, and we don't even use the word behold. Uh, at least I haven't lately. I mean, at work, do you say, behold, the laser printer is malfunctioning? Um, you don't say that as much anymore, behold. Um, but it is actually an interesting word. Uh, some of you hear Linus's voice, behold, I bring you tidings of great joy. Um, but what does this behold? It's an, actually, when you look at the Greek word, it's an interesting word. It's, it's not just simply look. That's kind of the way we sort of translate the word behold. Um, but the Greek word is ide, which uh, is an interesting word. It, it, it's used as an interjection to denote surprise. Behold, like look, exclamation point, um, and see. In fact, uh, in Thayer's Greek lexicon, it says the utterance of one who wishes that something should not be neglected by another. Have you ever been driving in a car with a friend and uh, you see something, you're in a conversation, but there's something that they're gonna miss it if, they, if you don't bring it up. So you're like, wait, 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 sorry, look. Uh, and you kind of interrupt the thing and there's a sense of surprise. That's the word I did. It just means, uh, don't miss this. Uh, this is gonna, you, know, you might miss this if you're not careful. And so this is, this is John the Baptist. When Jesus starts walking by, he says, behold, like everybody stop what you're doing and look, uh, this is important. And then Jesus is referred to by John the Baptist as a lamb. Why is Jesus related to a lamb? Uh, why not a lion? Well, uh, you know, uh, if you know your Bible, that's the second coming of Christ. He's gonna come as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, but how much contrast can you endure? A lion versus a lamb. I mean, there's quite a difference there. Well, this explains a lot. And if you're a Jewish person in the first century and you hear John the Baptist saying, behold, the lamb of God, um, this would echo back to the story we told a couple of weeks ago about Abraham, Isaac going up the mountain. God will provide himself a lamb. Um, and this is God providing himself as the sacrificial lamb for all of humanity to be saved. Uh, you know, this is, this is something that's, that would have been more ingrained in their thinking. The lamb speaks of blood sacrifice on an altar. Um, you know, I've got some experience with sheep uh, as, a, as a, at our little farm, a uh, little kid, you know, I was in 4-H. I, I, I did, uh, you know, some, some work with cows, but I also did some stuff with sheep. And I had a little sheep named Pierre. He, he was this little black faced Suffolk uh, and he had a little white mustache and he looked kind of French. So I called him Pierre. Um, but uh, Pierre, uh, you know, one thing I learned about sheep as a little sheep farmer kid is they are in fact as dumb as a brick. Oh, they're cute and cuddly, but stupid sheep are dumb. And isn't it appropriate in Isaiah 53 verse six says all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Um, the Lord compares us to sheep. Now, you and I, we kind of say, well, that's an easy uh, um, you know, comparison. Yeah, we are dumb sometimes. We go the wrong way and we do stupid stuff. But how can you say Jesus is a sheep? 
um, you know, a lamb, even a baby sheep. Like that's even worse almost. Uh, how is that possible? Well, I think there's two main reasons Jesus is referred to as a, as a lamb. The first reason is the idea of showing that, that he became one of us. Relatability. We're just little helpless sheep. Uh, but what did Jesus do? He became one of us, Philippians 2, 7. But he made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So God is showing us that, that he, God, becomes a man. Uh, we did that, you know, the last three uh, weekend services, we've been talking about Jesus, the uh, incarnate word of God, God incarnate, uh, so important part of Christian doctrine. But he comes down in a relatable form as a, as a lamb. Uh, he became one of us in, a, in frailty and, and in human, you know, even with our weaknesses and flaws. And he was tempted in all points like you and I were tempted. Uh, that's Jesus. So God is showing us, number one, that he became one of us. But this is probably bigger and even more important. God is showing us that he is the sacrifice for all of us. That's the main, I, I believe, reason why Jesus is depicted as a lamb. <clears throat> Isaiah 53, 7 um, prophesied concerning Jesus. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He opened not his mouth and he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, uh, as a sheep before the shearer. Uh, that's the, the comparison Isaiah the prophet would say about Jesus. So to the Jews, their mind goes immediately to the sacrificial lamb that they would bring to the altar. Thousands of these lambs um, sacrificed on the altars. And so when John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb of God. Now in other gospels, he would add, behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the whole world. Um, and this is the sacrificial part. Um, where did the idea of sacrifice come from? Well, actually, um, some people say, I, I remember, you know, college professors saying, you know, the Christian faith, the Bible just borrowed uh, human sacrificial themes of some of the pagan nations. They always try to act like the Bible stole concepts from other, you know, uh, ancient works and stuff. <clears throat> but I always like to remind uh, those people that believe such things, um, the Bible actually tells us where sacrifice really started. What's the earliest, uh, you know, uh, picture or type of sacrifice uh, that we read about in the Bible? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve. Yes, you guys are right. Uh, uh, in Genesis chapter three, um, verse 21, we have the story where Adam and Eve sinned. Um, and uh, they, what did they realize? Suddenly they said, we're naked. Ah! They're running around totally ashamed. And so they go and sow fig leaves together. Now I've been to the Middle East quite a few times and when I've looked at all the fig trees and stuff, I've went and felt the fig leaves, not a good idea. You know those little follicles that are on, the, on leaves and stuff? It's the worst idea I could ever imagine using those for clothing. Um, it'd be torturous. But they made fig leaves, sewed them together and sort of made tacky little clothes. But the Lord says, oh, I'm, it, like I love the compassion Lord, um, but what did the Lord do? He made clothing for them out of what? skins. Uh-oh. This is the first this is the first time we hear of something being killed, um, but I would say being sacrificed to do what? To cover. Sacrifice to cover. The cover their nakedness, the thing that their, you know, sin uh, was really exposing. Um, the Lord says, I'm going to cover that. And really the rest of the Bible is all about how the Lord's going to cover humanity um, and cover our sins. Um, that's such an important thing to understand. So the, the idea of that uh, Adam and Eve, uh, you know, Genesis three twenty one, is huge. Um, Cain and Abel is a good one too. Um, and, and if you said that, you're not wrong. Uh, you know, the Adam and Eve one is more of a, a, a sort of a picture, but actually Cain and Abel is the first more literal uh, idea of sacrificial lamb um, because of the language of, of uh, Genesis chapter four in the next chapter there. Uh, is, is, you know, basically Cain brought uh, fruit of the ground, uh, vegetables, and uh, brought as an offering to the Lord. And Abel brought uh, the first thing of his flock and the fat thereof. You say, well, what's that have to do with anything? Well, that, the, the way that's worded, it's the same wording the priests would do when they would offer the lamb to the Lord on the altar in the temple, you know, millennia later. Um, so uh, it's interesting that Abel brings a, a sacrifice that's very much the same, a lamb, the firstling, 
uh, and, and, and the fat thereof. It's, it's prepared the way you're supposed to prepare it for a sacrifice. And it says, the Lord had respect unto Abel's offering, but Cain and to his offering he had no respect. Um, and Cain went away angry and, and bitter, and it's the rest of his you know, history. But, but all that to say, why was God into uh, Abel's offering, but not Cain's? Um, well, as it turns out, God is not a vegan. He likes meat. So there you go. That's the, uh, oh, well, maybe, maybe that's not it. But uh, there is something to that I'm going to talk about. Uh, probably uh, you're going to be uh, uh, sick of hearing me talk about this stuff. But, but why did God accept Abel's offering and not Cain's? The, the idea was for a real sacrifice, blood had to be sacrificed. Um, and this would be a foreshadow for all of history. Um, the idea of the shedding of blood. Um, this is something that I've noticed when I moved to Portland, you know, 30 years ago or so. I, um, I remember just being kind of shocked at the way people responded to some of the stories I'd talk about, you know, farm stories or what have you. Um, the idea of where meat comes from. I, I can see people's skin crawl sometimes in Portlandia when I talk about, you know, like, like you know, we had three cows. Uh, well, we had, we had uh, dairy cows, but we did have these three beef cows uh, Huey, Dewey, and Louie is what we called them. Um, and, uh, and I remember when the butcher, you know, shows up in his blue truck with a big box refrigerator on the back and it had one of those little lift arms. And, and I just stood out there and watched him do it, you know, and he pulls out this captive bolt pistol, if you know what that is, and uh, popped, you know, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, dropped them, one, two, three. Um, and, uh, you know, and I remember, I remember as a kid kind of, you know, those are my cows. I fed them every morning, you know, and I remember, uh, feeling a little bit sad, uh, for a few minutes, um, right up until the hamburger started flowing <laughs> and man, it was awesome. Those were some good burgers. I remember to this day, how delicious Huey, Dewey and Louie were. Um, but, uh, but the reason that's important to understand is when you go to Safeway or, or, uh, you know, uh, wherever, and you go to the meat department, um, you have to understand there was an animal that died uh, for you to eat that sustenance. Now, um, uh, it's interesting because uh, when John the Baptist says, behold the lamb, he's not just talking about sheep. He's talking about blood sacrifice. The Jews would have already got that because that was so much ingrained in their religion, their culture. Um, but, um, but, you know, th have you ever noticed this whole uh, move toward veganism? Um, I'm not going to say everyone that's a vegan uh, uh, is, is, is um, you know, totally misguided, although I'm a little doubtful. But, uh, um, but if you're a vegan and you're saying you should all be vegans, it's the moral thing to do or it's the religious thing to do, um, then that's where it becomes total rebellion against God. Can I just say that again? If you're a vegan, let's just say it this way. If you're a vegan because you really want to just do that and you just really don't like meat and, and uh, it makes you feel better, good for you. Great. That's awesome. But as soon as you start telling everybody else you morally cannot you know, murder God's innocent animals or you can't uh, eat meat because of this or that and you start putting your thing on everybody else, that's where it becomes out, out, out and out rebellion. Um, you know, what does rebellion look like today? Um, I think for a long time we've known, okay, adultery is rebelling against God. God says, you know, you should not commit adultery or the 10 commandments. But in our modern days, one of the newer forms of rebellion is just to totally go against anything that God defines in his word. Uh, you know, like, uh, like, let me give you a few examples. In Genesis 5, 2, very clearly, the Bible says, God created male and female, created he them, and blessed them and called their name Adam. The world today says, no, God did not create them male and female. He made them many different genders, including female, male, transgender, cisgender, gender neutral, non-binary, agender, pangender, gender queer, queer, two-spirit, third gender, and all a combination or any combination of these. And, and I remember, you know, like 10 seconds ago, we used to just have two genders. And now our culture is saying, well, they went from two to three to, <coughs> to 70 to 95, and now it's an infinite number of genders there are out there. What is that? What, what, what's that all about? It's really simple. It's just rebellion against God and his creation. The end. That's all it is. It's rebellion. I think in the same way, when people say, you should not eat meat, um, uh, and they get all bitter about that, it's, it's interesting. I remember reading uh, about the last days there in 1 Timothy chapter 4, where it says this, Paul's talking to Timothy about what it's going to look like in the end times. 
Now the Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter times, that just means the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Check, check, check. We're seeing that today, wouldn't you agree? Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now notice this one, forbidding to marry and com commanding to abstain from meats. Now, I remember reading this 20 years ago thinking, who's gonna forbid people to marry and who would command people not to eat meat? Like that just, that was a head scratcher for me as a student of the Bible. And I thought, how's that gonna work out? Well, now the forbidding to marry, marriage, especially if you're a, a man and a woman getting married, that's controversial today. Like, I think there's a group of people who love to just abolish marriage altogether. And I think that might be where it's going in these last days. Uh, why mess with marriage? Why not just live with someone and forget all these benefits of the heterosexual marriages that are getting all these? Like, it's, it's really an interesting narrative. You can totally see how that's gonna go, you know, shake out. <clears throat> but what's this whole thing commanding to abstain from meats? There's a whole movement out there, if you're not aware, of people that are saying, yeah, we need to make eating meat a thing of the past. Um, there's a whole movement, by the way, um, <coughs> excuse me, where instead of eating meat, you're supposed to eat bugs. Have you guys seen that one? They're gonna push bugs on you now. And Nicole Kidman's there chomping down on bugs and stuff going, mm, delicious and you'll love it, you know? Um, but uh, that's kind of ridiculous. I'm not eating bugs, okay? Uh, just, I'd rather die. Um, <laughs> but, but now, that, you know, you got Bill Gates making fake meats and, and, and saying, this is better. Everybody needs to eat fake meat. And, and, and they've got all these reasons that are so hilarious of how you're not supposed to eat meat. And they're commanding, they're starting to command you because, well, uh, global, you know, climate change, global warming. Uh, so the cows, uh, all these cows that we have at these beef ranches, there's so many cows, they're, they're flatulating. And because of the gases of the cows, it's causing the, the world to, hey, there've been cows on the earth from, from the time of creation. Um, and they've been flatulating the whole time, happily. <laughs> um, this is all ridiculous stuff. Um, it was AOC that was trying to figure out how to capture the gases, the methane gas from the cows. There's these cows walking around with these tanks on their back uh, with an attachment, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, and it captures the gas. They're gonna try to harness the energy uh, instead of letting it go off into the hurt the ozone. Uh, hello, that's ridiculous. And I'll tell you what it is. It's rebellion against God. What do you mean, Brett? Well, well look what the rest of this says. They're gonna command to abstain from meats, which God hath created, to be received with thanksgiving. And I do. <laughs> uh, of, of them which believe, now notice this, what God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Who are those that believe and know the truth? Those who eat ribeye steaks. <laughs> so it says right there. For, <laughs> I'm not joking, for, verse four. <laughs> you guys are all laughing, that's hilarious. Nope, Brett's serious. Um, for, verse four, for every creature of God is good. Um, the idea is not like, oh, how cute. No, tasty. <laughs> and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Man says, stop killing animals and be a vegan, eat fake meat. Um, but this is just man rebelling against God. Blood and, and butchering uh, of animals it used to be just part of culture from the very beginning of time until we've sort of tucked it away where you know, Portlandia doesn't see what happens when chickens and beef and, and meat is made. But, but as it turns out, the Lord says, I made that for that purpose. That's one of the things God wanted to do. So this whole thing of you know, saving the poor animals and stuff, it's actually against what the Bible says. Blood, and, and, and I believe it, by the way, um, most hunters that I know, when they shoot a, a little beast out in the woods or whatever, or a big one, um, there's a sense of somberness. Uh, they don't just go, ha, ah, I slaughtered that animal. But most of the hunters I know, there's a, there's a sense of like knowing that there was blood sacrifice so that, they, that you could feed your family. And there's kind of a, a cool uh, notion that goes behind that. Uh, um, and, 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 and yet what's interesting is the very solution to all of humanity's problems will be blood sacrifice. And to have that same sobriety and somber heart when you realize um, the, the lamb of God that would be slain uh, before the foundations of the world, the whole thing, you gotta accept that Jesus is the lamb that was slain. 
So the practice was your best lamb slaughtering your best lamb. Uh, even Aaron the priest would have the people identify their sins upon the head of that lamb, transferring, almost like a, a, a type of how you're transferring my sins upon this animal, and then the animal is, is, is uh, sacrificed. Um, part of that would help people know, man, my sins are real. Blood sacrifice has to be made uh, for my sins. And they had to sort of connect the slitting of the throat of the lamb with their own sin. And that was what God wanted. Sin is bad, sin is serious. And the only thing you can do to be free from sin is blood sacrifice. Um, um, so all that to say in Hebrews 9.22, uh, we read that. In fact, uh, you know, it says, indeed under the law, Almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Um, that's an important thing to know. Uh, this is in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, but it goes all the way back to the law of the Old Testament. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law, but to what? Fulfill the law. And how did Jesus fulfill the law? In all ways. But this is one of those big ways. It comes from Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar, that's the sacrificial altar, to make an atonement. Mark that word, it's an important one. Atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. This is the law, um, and Jesus came to fulfill this law. Jesus would be our blood sacrifice that would make atonement. What's atonement? We, we use that, you know, cute little, uh, you know, breaking down of the word at one -ment, which is helpful. Uh, you know, our sin separates us from God, but when Jesus makes atonement, he makes us at one again with God. Our sin separates, atonement brings us back together. That's one way of looking at it. I like the, the if you look at the Hebrew definition of the word atonement, it's, it's this word kafar, which means to cover, to placate, to appease, to forgive, to pardon. The Old Testament word atonement, um, I'll take any one of those uh, you know, English definitions uh, when it's applied to my sin. I, I want my sins to be covered. Um, I want my sins to be placated and appeased. Um, the word appease and even placate uh, speaks of a New Testament word we know doctrinally called propitiation, which is the appeasement, the satisfaction of the requirement for our sinful uh, doom. Uh, the word appease, I'll take it. Forgive is another way of saying merciful and pardon. Um, these are all words that I want to have when it comes to my sins. And so if you want your sins covered, we, we know the Bible says there must be a blood sacrifice. Apart from that, there's no remission of sins. Um, um, and so uh, that's kind of an important thing. I love that the Lord, this word atonement, cover, I love that the Lord is desires to cover our sins. Um, our sins are ugly and they stink but the Lord says, I want to cover, uh, atone. Uh, are you a sin sniffer? Or are you a sin coverer? Uh, are you a, you know, iniquity inquisitor? Fault finder? Uh, be careful, don't be that, because that's not God's way. God sees all our sins, and there is a difference between covering up your sins. Uh, that's, that's a problem. There's, you shouldn't be covering up to try to make sure nobody finds out about it. But the idea to cover is, is what the Bible teaches. First Peter chapter four, verse eight says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. That's a, that's a godly characteristic to cover. Like Isaiah 61, 10, I will robe you in my righteousness. That's the heart of the Lord that he wants to do that. Um, the, the, the uncoverer of sin is actually judged in the Bible. Did you know that? Um, to do the opposite of what God does is not a good thing. There's a great story in the Bible that you didn't color in Sunday school. Um, <laughs> the one that you colored was Noah and the ark and the animals and the rainbow and the altar and the sacrifice. And then that was kind of the end of the story when you're in Sunday school, but that's not where the story ends. The story ends with all that happy little story of Noah and the ark and the family was saved. But then after that, Noah goes into his, his tent and gets totally sloshed drunk strips totally naked and starts, you know, busting a move in his tent. <laughs> Total party in, in, his, in his tent there. And his son Ham looks and says, whoa, dad's partying now naked in the tent. And, um, and so he goes and gets his two brothers. Hey, Shem, Japheth, get over here, check out dad. And Shem and Japheth, what did they do? They did something very different than Ham. Ham exposed their sin. But Shem and Japheth took a, a cloak and put it between their shoulders and made a curtain. 
and then walked backward up against the door of the tent, not looking upon their father's nakedness like Ham did, and they covered. What's interesting about that story, that's why I didn't color it, by the way, in Sunday school, because it's a little graphic. A little. Um, but what's great about that story is, you know, um, I, I'm finding it interesting. The Bible doesn't even deal with Noah's sin of drunkenness and being naked, dancing in his tent. It's like, yeah, whatever. He's still a hero of faith. And he goes down as a great man of faith. We don't even, like the Bible doesn't even bring that up as a problem. I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't. It's just, that wasn't the big deal. But Ham, his exposing his dad's sin and nakedness got him in big trouble and he became cursed because of that. Um, just, just note, that's kind of the way it goes. Um, if you're a sin sniffer, fault finder, uncovering other people's sins, that's not a very godly characteristic. Um, I think that's important to know that. Again, there's a difference between covering up versus covering. Uh, don't, don't write letters on that one. I get it, and, and there's a difference. But uh, as it turns out, um, all that to say, uh, you know, your sin. By the way, uh, you say, but what if people are getting away with sin and I'm supposed to, well, you have to understand the Bible promises this, you know, Numbers 32, 23, be sure of this, your sin will find you out. That's just a promise of God's word. Um, as a Christian, um, we need to understand those sins are gonna be revealed, uh, but we need to learn to be loving and, and covering. So how does God cover sins? It's through uh, atonement. And how is atonement achieved? Through blood sacrifice, the end. So as it turns out, Jesus would be the ultimate blood sacrifice. Um, you know, it wasn't the worst lamb. It wasn't just any lamb. It had to be the best lamb. And, um, and so we have to understand the punishment for sin, of course, um, you know, the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. But the good news is the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How does he do this? Being the lamb that would be slain for your sins in your place. God doesn't just wink at your sin and say, I'll keep you from the death, eternal death in hell. And he doesn't just wink at it. He deals with it through atonement, the work of blood sacrifice. Um, your sin will find you out. It's a guaranteed. Um, that's kind of an important thing. Now, now you say, okay, Brett, great. Got it. Uh, Christianity 101. Um, but what does this have to do with Palm Sunday? Well, I find it interesting here on our Sunday that we're going through the Bible, John the Baptist is going, behold the Lamb of God. And everybody's looking at Jesus suddenly. Um, and this is important because as it turns out, um, the, this, this, uh, this is during that time where, you know, when, when Jesus is de declared the Lamb, um, <clears throat> the Passover uh, would be the time where the, the Lamb sacrifice was first instituted. Remember, the Old Testament sacrificing of lambs. They did it by the thousands, millions through the centuries. <clears throat> but all of those Old Testament lambs sacrificed at the tabernacle, then later the temple, were all pictures of Jesus Christ. They were pointing to the lamb, Jesus. Um, and the Jews were supposed to do that to sort of commemorate what's gonna come in the future. Uh, so the Passover was that celebration. Did you know the Passover is kind of a big deal in the Bible? It's used 76 times, the word Passover in the Bible, 48 times in the New Testament even. <clears throat> Only two times is the word Passover used outside of the gospels in the New Testament. One of those times it's mentioned is 1 Corinthians 5, 7, <clears throat> where, <clears throat> excuse me, it says, purge out therefore <clears throat> the old leaven. Remember leaven is a type of sin. Purge out leaven that you may be a new lump um, as you are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Notice Paul tells the Corinthian church, Christ is our Passover. So that's important. Now, don't forget the purge out the leaven. I'll come back to that in a second. But the, the point is, Paul's saying, as, as the Gentile church, as the New Testament church, we no longer celebrate the Seder dinner or the, the Passover supper. That's why the church generally doesn't do that. Now, if you wanna celebrate a Seder dinner or Passover just to, uh, for fun to commemorate the Old Testament practice of the Jews and see the pictures of Jesus, that's great. But we don't have to do that. Why? Because Christ is our Passover. The Old Testament Passover dinner was to point to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. When he came, there was no longer a need for Passover. There's a need for something else, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so question, when was the first Passover instituted? Well, if you recall, it's there in Exodus chapter 12, when the children of Israel 
were enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. And finally, the Lord brings Moses, the deliverer, and there's all the plagues that hit Israel, uh, pardon me, hit Egypt. And if you recall, the very last of the plagues um, was this uh, angel of death would go over all the land of Egypt. And there God tells Moses what the children of Israel were supposed to do. And this is where Passover was in. So let's kind of review that for a second. Exodus chapter 12, verse three, um, God says to Moses, speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel saying, in the 10th day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Okay, so this is where the, this idea of a lamb at Passover was instituted. Before we keep reading, I wanna show you a progression that I think is important. Notice how he says, first of all, everybody gets a lamb, but then it zeroes in to the lamb, uh, and then it gets more personal to your lamb. I think that's an important thing. Um, Christ, the Passover lamb, which one is he to you? To Oprah Winfrey, he's just a lamb. Jesus is a way to heaven. Uh, there's many paths that lead to heaven and Jesus is just one of many ways. He was a good man, a good teacher, a good prophet, um, but that's not true. Um, Jesus is not a lamb. He, as, as it turns out, he's the lamb. I hope at least you recognize that, that he is the lamb. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father which is in heaven, but by me. Jesus is the lamb, but maybe even more importantly, I would implore you to accept Jesus, not just as the lamb, but to say he is your lamb or, or my lamb, my personal savior. Uh, that's what you need to, to, to think about and do. Um, I love that. By the way, after this was instituted, um, the Passover lamb was always referred to in the singular. It was no longer all the lambs slain at Passover because there'd be tens of thousands of lambs killed um, at Passover. Um, but they didn't say all the multitude of lambs. It was always referred to the lamb, singular, because it was pointing to Jesus Christ. That's important. Well, as you read on verse five, it says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep, from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Um, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, there's so many pieces of this that's kind of important, but um, they were to select a lamb. Um, they were to kill it on the 14th day. Does anybody remember what day did it say earlier that they were supposed to choose and select their lamb? The 10th day of Nisan. Now, some of you are like, Brett, what does Datsun have to do with anything? Um, Nisan is a, a month of the Hebrew calendar. They use the, the uh, lunar calendar. We use more of a Gregorian kind of calendar. So it's a different calendar. But Nisan was the month of Passover. And it's important you notice the dates. So on the 10th day of Nisan, they would select the lamb and choose whether they're gonna accept it. Why would they not accept it? Well, first of all, it had to be without blemish. It had to be spotless lamb. Uh, and, um, and it had to be, uh, that, you know, that, that's Jesus. Jesus was spotless. He, he who knew no sin became sin for us. That's, that's the important part. Jesus was spotless. He was the spotless lamb. Notice another requirement. It had to be a male of the first year. In sheep 4-H, when I was doing that as a kid, one of the things you learn is when can lamb chops be rated as prime? Um, they have to be killed or butchered in their prime, which just happens to be a male of the first year. That's prime choice lamb chops. Uh, male of the first year. That's when they do that. Uh, so even as Jesus was a male in his prime, in his young 30s, Jesus was crucified on the cross. <clears throat> but also, notice it says here, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it, the lamb, in the evening. How does the whole congregation of the Israel kill one lamb? Because they're talking about the lamb, your lamb, and the whole congregation. This is the whole exact question. Did the Jews kill Jesus, the Messiah? Some people are like, that's, uh, that's kind of, I don't know, in this world of anti-Semitism, should I even say that? Um, you can say it wholeheartedly, yes, the Jews killed Jesus the Messiah, but you also have to say, and so did we. We're just as guilty, our sin put Jesus on the cross. Um, the Jews, the Romans, uh, us, we're all guilty of, of Jesus' death. Um, but this is where this, this language of Exodus 12 is just pointing us to Jesus. 
The whole assembly of the congregation, that's, that, in, in the New Testament terms, that's all of us. We are the ones who put Jesus on the cross because of our sins. Now, you say, okay, Brett, again, what does this have to do with Palm Sunday? Well, this is where it gets interesting. You all know that Jesus was crucified on Passover there, so, so uh, that already is an amazing connection. The 14th day of Nisan, as it turns out, thousands of years after this Exodus 12 was written, it just happened. Was it a coincidence that Jesus was sacrificed on the day they would sacrifice the lamb and butcher it uh, for Passover? Was that just a coincidence? No, that's God just lining his word perfectly up. That's kind of cool. But if you go back from the day Jesus was crucified on Passover, the 14th day of Nisan, if you go back to the 10th of Nisan, what was Jesus doing at that time? Anybody know? Yes. Some of you said it. he was riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. The day the Jews were supposed to select the lamb and make sure he was without blemish, male of the first year, the very day they were all choosing their lambs, guess what they were doing when Jesus rode in? Choosing whether they were gonna accept or reject Jesus, the lamb. It was the day of choosing. John the Baptist already declared, behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. But in that Palm Sunday road, and that's why I have the picture behind me is because this, when you're riding the donkey down the hill of, of the Mount of Olives, this is what you're looking at is Jesus was approaching Jerusalem uh, and the Eastern gate that's behind me. Jesus would be riding up in that area um, and the people were gonna choose. And you say, well, Brett, they were crying Hosanna. They put palm branches down and put their clothes down. That's what they would do for a king. They were accepting him. The problem is they were not accepting him as the lamb that would be slain. They were accepting him as the king that would take over the Roman empire and save them from the iron oppression of the iron fist of Rome. Um, that was the problem. When they realized that Jesus was not the one who was gonna deliver them from the Romans, um, it would be only a short time after that, they'd all be yelling out, crucify him. We will not have this man rule over us. Jesus would be the stone that was rejected. Remember that sermon a few months ago? But he'd also be the lamb that would be rejected. Interestingly enough, Jesus would be the lamb that the people would reject, but little did they know he was the only lamb worthy to be slain for the sins of the world. This is an important part of this. Um, and so, Without Jesus, there'd be no remission of sin. Without the shedding of Jesus' blood, there'd be no remission of sin, like our Hebrews 9.22 scripture. This is where I really hope and pray that Jesus is, in fact, your lamb. That's the question of the day, I think. Is Jesus your lamb? Are you one of the people who said, oh, it was nice that Jesus came and he was a good teacher? Um, nope, that's not who he was. He's not a lamb. He's the lamb. But the big question is, are you gonna accept or reject? Those people had that decision on Palm Sunday when they were trying to decide who is this guy who's riding in this colt of a donkey down the hill of the Mount of Olives. And little did they know he was the lamb that they need to accept and receive. You see, um, you, you have to choose. Are, you, are we gonna take this, this blood sacrifice part seriously? Question, quiz time. How many of you in this room, by show of hands, how many of you are the firstborn or the uh, only child in your household? How many of you? Raise your hands. Look at that, that's like half, half the congregation. Let me ask you the firstborn. Let's say you're back there in Exodus 12 and the Passover and the spirit of death's gonna come over your house and it tells you all the stuff we just read. Um, you're supposed to choose a lamb that's without spot. Would you be involved in choosing of that lamb? Man, I bet some of you guys would be like looking under the armpits of like, you know, like, oh, gee, I'm pretty nice there. Yeah, checking out every little detail, making sure. Because you'd want to make sure it was without spot or blemish. Question, if you're the firstborn and the spirit of death is coming, would you make sure the blood was put on the right places of the doorpost? I mean, I'd be out there with an airless sprayer, man. Just making sure it's real, the whole thing's just really red. I don't want that spirit of death. Like, like um, you know, but sadly, um, unfortunately, Egypt... And maybe even some of the Jews said, oh, that's dumb. Sacrificing a lamb, painting blood on your doorpost, that's ridiculous. Um, is that supposed to save us? But sadly, the spirit of death came over those houses and the firstborn was slain of everyone that didn't have the door on the bus. Let me, let me talk to some of you that are legalistic. Some of you that are saying, Pastor Brett, you teach cheap grace and you're saved by grace, but you also have to do good works. Can I just say, um, remember when we read about uh, the, the um, sacrifice of the lamb, but remember before Jesus is our Passover, it says they needed to clean out the leaven, get all the leaven out of their houses. That's part of the Exodus 12 story. They, they were supposed to get all the, leaven is a type of sin in the Bible. 
And before they killed the lamb, they were to get all the leaven out of their house. And I've heard that as an argument that, um, yeah, you, you also have to get the leaven out. So you gotta clean your life up and you have to be sinless, uh, you know, and then, and then plead the blood of Jesus. I'll tell you why that doesn't work. Because um, let me just ask you, if you know your Bible, um, if the person, you know, sort of swept out the leaven, but didn't get it all out, just a little leaven's left behind. What does the Bible say about a little leaven? Yeah, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. In other words, unless you get every single speck out, you're still like leavened. Um, and so <clears throat> let's just presuppose that a household, they went and swept everything, but they didn't get every corner of the, of the house. Um, uh, but they did put blood on the doorpost. When the spirit of death came, if there was even a speck of leaven in the ca ca cabinet, would, um, would the firstborn have been killed in that household if there was blood on the door? No, they'd be alive and well. That's important to know that. Because the spirit of death wasn't looking for the leaven that was cleaned out. The Bible says the spirit of death, when it came over the house, when it saw the blood on the doorposts, it passed over the house. In the same way, um, what if everybody did get perfectly cleaned leaven? What if, what if a house was spotless? <clears throat> Man, they shop vacked every corner of their cabinets and just got it all cleaned up, but they didn't put blood on their doorposts where the firstborn had been killed? Yes. yes. The reason I go into that, just because I want to remind you, you're not saved by your works. Ephesians 2.8 says you're saved by grace through faith. That's faith in Jesus, the sacrificial lamb. Um, not of yourselves, it's a gift from God, not of your works, lest any man should boast. I'm really cool, I got it all cleaned up. Nobody can say that. So this is a beautiful message. Jesus died on the cross for your sins to be the blood sacrifice. The question is, have you accepted Jesus as your savior? Um, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me, all that to say, is Jesus your lamb? If it's not, if he's not, how do you accept it? Bible makes it clear. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, that God raised him from the dead. In other words, that he died on the cross for your sins, that he rose from the grave. And if you believe that and confess that from your heart, through your mouth, the Bible says you'll be saved. Um, how could I be saved? Same reason the people of Exodus, the blood that was applied made the, the death pass over. Hell and death for you and I, if we have the blood of Jesus in our lives, hell and death will pass over us in the same way. It's all a picture pointing to Jesus. Um, before we go, I got a couple things we need to do, so don't pack it up, but would you bow your heads with me, please? And with a heart of prayer, I just wanna ask, is Jesus your lamb? And if you can't say for sure, let's make sure. Um, becoming a Christian is um, really simple, and I'll tell you why, because Jesus did all the work. Your job is to repent and say, okay, I, I just know I'm a sinner. I acknowledge my sin before God, that I've failed, that I deserve death. That's what the Bible teaches, and just to accept that. And then to receive salvation, you just simply uh, have to just believe that Jesus died for you and that his blood, his innocent blood that was shed is good enough to save you, and to accept that. With confession with the mouth, belief in your heart. If that's you and you'd like to do that, you've never done it, you're saying, Brad, I don't know if I've ever really accepted Christ or maybe I went to church a few times or was a good person. Well, actually, none of us are good and going to church doesn't do that for you. It's accepting the work of Jesus on the cross. I'd like to pray a prayer of that confession with anybody who would want to. If that's you, I'm not gonna embarrass you, but right where you're sitting, with everybody else's heads bowed, if that's you, would you look up and just give me a quick wave and I'll just acknowledge you before we, uh, before we go today. You guys back there, awesome, good, good, cool. Let me just look around, I don't wanna miss anybody over here, I see you there, good. I'm just gonna look around a little bit more, I don't wanna miss anybody, awesome, over here, good. Good, good, over here, I see you. I'm gonna pray this prayer of confession. And uh, this is where we just say, we need the blood of Jesus to wash away our sins. Um, what can wash away our sins? The old hymn goes, nothing but the blood of Jesus. So this is accepting that free work. So would you just repeat this prayer? I'm the whole church to pray this prayer with us together. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I believe in your son, Jesus, that he died on the cross for my sins, that he rose up from the grave, and that my sins are forgiven. Help me to walk with you. Thank you for saving me. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Awesome.
Bible says you're saved because of that confession of faith. It's all the work that Jesus did. That's so cool. Now, if you're a Christian, which you are now, if you've confessed that, um, we have a way, I told you that the sacrificial system was a way for the Jews to look forward into history of Jesus. But after Jesus died on the cross, no longer do you and I go down to the altar and slay a lamb. Aren't you glad for that? I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore. But what Jesus did tell us, the New Testament church to do is to remember the lamb that was slain through the institution of communion. The bread and the cup, that's what he instituted there, uh, Eucharist, call it what you want. And I'd like to end the service with that. So if you'd get out the little packets you, you received on the way in, if you didn't get one, the guys will come up and get you set up with that. But you'd peel the bottom part off first to get to that little piece of matzah bread that's in there. And then you open up the top portion and you get to the, the cup uh, there, that's, uh, that's the cup of Christ. So let's kind of get that all ready. Lord, I pray this morning as we take time to celebrate and remember um, the beauty of the cross, the beautiful work of the cross. And I pray, Lord, that as we take this time to, to uh, remember that, that we would, even as we talked about, that there'd be sort of that sobriety of what actually had to happen. Uh, not a sheep or a cow being slain, but the Son of God. I pray, Lord, that we would just truly be thankful for that pray your blessing on this congregation as we take this time. Lord, you are my strong tower. Yes, you are my hiding place. And I'll take refuge in who you are. It's with you I find my peace And so I'll sing In the shadow of your wing And I'll rest Here in your arms So I'll sing In the shadow of your wing I'll find my peace. Lord, how thankful we are for this bread that reminds us of what you did for us, taking our penalty uh, on, on yourself. The nails in your hands, the nails in your feet, the crown of thorns, the whipping on your back, ultimately the spear in your side, all of those wounds. You did it for us, Lord, with us in mind. The joy that was set before you, you endured the cross despise the shame. And I pray, Lord, that as we eat this bread, we just with thanksgiving, just be once again, your church blessed by what you've done for us. So bless this time, Lord, as we eat this bread, we do it with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all eat of Christ together. And after the bread, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant. No longer bulls, rams, goats, sacrifices that would point to the lamb. But we as the Christian church get to drink this cup remembering that Jesus, his innocent blood was shed on our behalf. And as we drink this, we can know that our sins are forgiven. Past, present, future, he died once for all sin. And um, Lord, I pray that you'd help us with just a new hunger and thirst after righteousness. As we drink this, we thank you for the forgiveness, but we also pray that we just long to be in line with your plan and purpose, just that much more. That we'd be obedient and following your word. Bless these, your people, Lord. We thank you for our salvation and we drink deeply now of the cup of Christ in Jesus' name. And let's all drink of Jesus together. What can I give to you for 
all that you've given to me I'll give glory and honor from a heart made new I'll give my life to you let's all stand together what can I give to you for all that you've given to me I'll give glory and honor from a heart made new I'll give my life to you I'll give my life Lord, we do. We give our lives to you afresh today. And I pray as we go our way, we'd rejoice. Thank you for the cleansing, the washing, the forgiveness of sins. For these new believers, Lord, today that have accepted you, I pray you'd wrap your loving arms around them, that they'd sense the burden of their sin just lifted from their shoulders, and that they'd rejoice in the hope of heaven, Lord. Bless them. Bless this crew, we pray. And we give this morning to you in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. amen. See you next time. You're dismissed.